Good afternoon. Uh, this is CIVE 633, Environmental Hydrology, and today is Tuesday, uh, October uh, 19, 2021. And the subject today, uh, we're still trying to finish that, that uh, paper on the Amazon uh, River Colors, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes on it, and then I will move on to the next subject which is, I believe, the theme of river and lake restoration. We're going to be talking about a river in Northern California and then the restoration of the Salton Sea, which is a major, a major subject in this class. So um, let me just uh, share the screen in here with you. Right, OK. Can you see the green page? Yeah, we can see it. Yep. Okay, cool. You know, I think I already showed the green is our color. It's the color of the visual lab. One or two colors of the visual lab, they're green. The 792, that's the color of the visual lab. Okay, so um, I wrote this paper uh, two years ago uh, with one of our visitors. We had a visitor from Brazil, and she was uh, a biologist, biologist ecologist. And I thought this this would be a paper that would be suited to her background because she did it. She wrote it. I kind of co-signed it because uh, I suggested the topic and, and, and I know enough about the subject. But there's a lot of technicalities in here, which are mostly biological, ecological, or environmental. And you know, we, it's very hard to draw the line between environmental and biology. So we, all of us have to learn a little bit of that. I, we know we're not neither biologists nor, uh, well, we kind of are environmental. This, all civils are a little bit environmental. And then if you become in, if you get, a, get into environmental engineering, then you become more environmental. That is a fact. Okay, so we know from our own experience that the Amazon River has different, uh, different type rivers. And as a matter of fact, that picture that you see in there, the meeting of the waters near Manaus, Brazil, was taken by me. I took it uh, back about 30 years ago when I was there. Uh, I had heard about it, I, but I'd never seen it. So I went over there on a boat and we got to the point where the waters of the Amazon River meet the Negro River. The Negro River coming from the north and the Amazon from the west. And you can see in here, these are the Amazon River waters. They're kind of brownish a little bit, regular river color. And these are the Negro River, not more like blue, but they're called Negro over there. It's kind of darkish, okay? So that's the meaning of the waters. So uh, Samara, who did, the, who did this paper, wrote this paper 20 years ago, uh, well, we kind of structured the, the report and I said to her, this is, you know, this is what we need to do. So she uh, researched the subject of the types of Amazonian river tributaries. And she, of course, eventually got to Mr. Junk or Dr. Junk, who is one of the scientists that had put so much effort on the Amazon. And uh, this, this um, plot over here is, is uh, his plot. And if I understand that correctly, we redid it. This must be the redoing of his graph because he was, his, his graph was a little bit confusing. We replotted the graph. This is a very indicative graph of what's actually happening out there. As you can see, uh, this graph is plotting the tributaries of the Amazon. Uh, you can see in here, some of you may not be very familiar with. But the Amazon originates, it's, their, it's headwater, or their head, the headwaters of the Amazon originates from north to south in um, right here in Guyana, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and Brazil. So about six or seven countries. Uh, so it's, it's large. It's the largest um, basin in the world. Uh, it has a lot of water. As a matter of fact, we know from calculation that uh, the dr drainage of the Amazon here at Pará, right here is Pará. Uh, I'm sorry, Belén, Belén, Pará. 
for the Macapa. There's two cities in there, one on the left and one on the right side, uh, Macapa and Belen, Belen do Pará. These are the cities uh, at the mouth of the Amazon. And the flow in this, in this area is about one sixth of the total flow of all the rivers of the world combined, the flow of fresh water. So it's a huge river. As you can see, it has, uh, according to the, the Scioli classification, Harald Scioli did a classification which has stuck in the literature, uh, even though the name's a little bit uh, misleading, but he classified as white water, the brown waters. The brown waters, he called it white water. The black waters were black waters, and then the clear waters, or the white waters are called clear. So it's a bit confusing, but we have to live with it because Scioli's, Scioli's uh, classification is a very uh, well-known classification. And as you can see in here, the colors are a little misleading. Uh, the one on the left is called clear water. It's kind of greenish. The one in the middle is called white water, and that's kind of brownish. And the third one is definitely bluish or dark or black color. This is interesting. I am not sure if an, in another parts of the world the same thing happens, but we know that this happens, of course, in the Amazon. It's interesting because resources can be uh, studied and uh, considered depending on the color of the river. For one thing, we know, for instance, that mosquitoes don't grow in black rivers. So you can go out there in the, in the River Negro and have a boat trip for a few days and you would not you will not be bothered by mosquitoes well if you go on some of the large rivers in the in bolivia for instance there's some rivers out there in bolivia like the Huapore and others that are so bad that i mean you go out there and the chances in a couple of days you get malaria okay so it's a kind of an area, an area not to be in or you could fight it but why fight it why go out there into the mouth, the lion's mouth, so to speak, in terms of the malaria. Malaria is a pretty bad, um, bad uh, illness. Professor Balik from uh, the Czech Republic, whom I met in, when I was in India, had written a book, uh, and his book was called Tropical Hydrology. And his tropical hydrology encompassed the work that he did mostly in India. I'm sorry, not in India, in Africa, what am I talking here? Africa. And he told me at the time, this was back in 1993, I believe. He's, he told me that he had had five bouts with malaria. Over, the, I mean, he was an older gentleman at that time. So over the course of his, his career in tropical hydrology, he contracted malaria five times. So that's pretty, pretty sad, but he was, a, he was able to survive. Okay, this is a chart by Junk, our, our friend, Professor Wolfgang Junk from Germany, and I, uh, it sounds like in English, it would sound like junk, but I don't want to call him junk because he doesn't even call himself junk. He calls himself Junk, okay? And I guess that's the, the German pronunciation. So he is plotting here the various rivers in terms of Look at the world average here in hydro, uh, specific conductivity, electrical conductivity, the world average, and, and then the pH. As you can see, the pH doesn't differ, differs, but not a whole lot, but the conductivity does increase or is decreased for the Solimois River, which by the way, in uh, Jung's terminology, that's the Amazon. And the Kuroa River is, uh, over here, and we talk about the Kuroa River, uh, clear water. The Kuroa Yuna River is clear water. The Negro River is dark water. Look at the Negro River has very low uh, specific conductivity, specific conductance, and compared to rainwater and the pH are also here. More importantly though, on the right side, uh, they have done a chemical analysis and they determined that um, for instance, in the, when you have the Black River, uh, the calcium is, is low, while in uh, the Solimos River, that is the main Amazon, central Amazon, calcium is high and sodium, sodium and potassium are low. I mean, if you study this carefully, you're, you're able to see differences in the constitution from the soils. And that's because 
um, the uh, the content of these um, these two types of, of metals. Uh, one of them is the alkali metals, which is sodium and potassium, and then the alkali, alkaline earth metals, which are the magnesium and calcium. Uh, the, the constitution of the co composition determines uh, the chemical composition and the utility and so on and so forth of the waters. True though, that when two of these tributaries have different colors that they mix, they eventually get mixed. Like the Amazon with its brownish color wins over the Negro eventually. It kind of overwhelms the Negro because the Negro may be a large river, and in fact it is, but the Amazon is a lot bigger. I mean, you know, you could just see the drainages and so forth. The Amazon drains a very large area at Manaus, which is where it joins or meets the Negro. So, uh, so Samara talks about the Solimos River water. Interesting history and hero story. Uh, the, the Portuguese, or rather the Brazilians, call the, the birth of the Amazon in Manaus, Brazil. In other words, anything above the Manaus is called the Solimos, upstream of Manaus. Well, the Peruvians, where the Amazon originates, call the birth of the Amazon at Iquitos, Peru. I mean, they both claim that Amazon is born within their territories. So you got uh, the Amazon in Peru, then the Solimois in, in Brazil, then again the Amazon. That's not an unusual case. The Tijuana River has the same problem, if you wish to call it a problem. The Tijuana River originates um, somewhere in Mexico, and then for a while um, it gets into Mexico and it's called Tijuana, or rather it's called something else. Well, the same thing happens. I don't recall exactly right now. But uh, the Tijuana River goes into the United States and then it goes back into Mexico. So same thing. Uh, same thing in terms of the naming of what the name of the mainstream river is. Okay. So that's the Solimois River. Then the Negro River, Blackwater. Uh, the difference is that the Solimois, the Solimois River, with the white water, is, is, its content is predominantly sediments which are good. The sediments are the beginning of life. That's, they have all the nutrients that we, everybody eventually is going to use for, for, for survival. Uh, the black water, is, there's, it's not as much. It has other types of life, but the point is that the black water are kind of infertile in terms of uh, what we call fertility. Uh, but it, that's, that's a good thing because like, for instance, the, the mosquitoes need to nest where there's food. They're not going to nest where there's no food. And therefore, that's why the mosquitoes don't nest in the black water, because there's hardly any food out there. So what is the reality, the constitution of the black water? And the answer is humic substances. It's not sediment. So what's a humic substance? Humic substance is the end product of the degradation of organic matter. So what this means is that over here, there's very little sediment, and there's a whole lot of dead matter. Humic substances is dead matter in the process of decomposition back to the elements. It hasn't taken place yet. It's kind of taking place, but it's taking, it is slow. So where does this humic substance come? It comes from the plants. It's come from the, uh, the plant. There's a whole lot of plants out there and they all decompose organic, or they have organic matter that decomposes. And that gets into the groundwater. From the groundwater, it goes into the base flow. You're gonna kind of absorb by the groundwater and then it flows into the base flow. And there is a lot of base flow out there. Those rivers are constituted by at least one third, if not, my, if not more, by base flow. Because there's a lot of water everywhere, right? So therefore, in that case, uh, we have the humic substances predominating hardly any sediments. I've actually been on the Negro a couple times out there, navigated a little bit on the Negro, on the Negro when I was young, maybe 30 years ago. And there are no, hardly any sediment out there because of the geomorphology of the terrain and the climate. There's three things that come into bear, coming into bear in our analysis as environmental engineers. That is the climate, the hydrology, and the geomorphology. 
and uh, not next week, but the following week, I believe we're going to get heavily into that. So just let's just sit down and wait when I start talking about that subject, which I call eco-hydroclimatology, the combination of ecology, hydrology, and, and climatology. Okay, so that's the Negro River. Flat terrain and no sediment, no hills. The hills are the ones that produce the brown terrain, I mean the brown uh, water, meaning the white waters, because the sediment has a tendency to have brownish color. Okay, here there's a nice picture I pull out of the web. I guess Samara pulled this out of the web. There's a lot of webs, a lot of resources on the web. This is the meeting of the waters. This is a better picture than mine, obviously, because this one's taken from a plane. Mine was taken just from a boat. But there is, it's fascinating to see uh, the meeting of the waters, the Negro on the right and the Solimo is on the, on the left. And finally, now that we know the brown waters, or like I guess we call them white waters and the black waters, the question is, what about these other waters that are, don't, don't have any sediment and they don't have any organic matter either? These are called the clear water rivers. So why and how is it that they originate? Well, they originate from flat areas that are rocky, that are not sedimentary. They don't have sediment. There's two areas of the source for this water, the Guyana Shield over here and the Brazilian Shield. And they call it shield because it's a, it's a rocky shield. Uh, it's also referred to with the word cratons. Now, not that word is not many people know that word, but look it up. Craton is the shield, the, the, the I guess you can say, uh, Tertiary, it's tertiary rocks, not quaternary uh, sediments. And uh, turns out that out there, there's hardly any soil. Therefore, there's no erosion, there's no erosion for the rocks. And therefore, uh, the water is clear. The water is mostly clear. So you have these three types of rivers in the Amazon because it covers a whole lot of ground, a, lot of, a whole lot of geography. But, and they, are, they also have different uh, behaviors from an ecological standpoint, and that is why they need to be studied by ecologists mostly, because of the issues of management. Uh, like for instance, the, um, the Varsea, which is a Portuguese word that means area that can be flooded next to, uh, next to a brown river, or rather not brown, I'm confused the colors here, uh, the white rivers, sediment rivers. Uh, the area that is seasonally flooded is called Bar Varsea, with a V. And like, uh, on, on the other hand, in the, uh, in the Clearwater Rivers, the area that is seasonally fl flooded is called Igapo. It's a different area, different situations, the vegetation is different, and so forth. So people that study this, which are the <laughs> biologists, actually the... Yeah, the ecosystemic biologists, also the botanists, um, they look at this very carefully. And of course, they have to look at the characteristics of chemical characteristics as, as we list in here. The characteristics of color, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, ammonia, 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 ammonium, ammonium ion, by the way, pH, etc. We don't get into P, the PE in here because we're not talking real wetlands with soil. This is just water. Okay, so that's the end of this paper. And what I'd like to do now is I am going to uh, I'm going to go to the next paper, which is over here and over here. And I'm going to show a video. And while I am showing the video, I am going to be talking about it. Um, this video I took 11 years ago when I was invited to go to a party over in the field out there, Red Clover Creek. They, were, they had a celebration, a 20 year celebration. This is what happened. I mean, the, 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 um, I think the, the video will tell it all. So I'll, I'll just feel free to stop the video if I may, may want to clarify uh, the situation as we, as we proceed. Uh, I don't like this stuff. Red Clover Creek, 
is a creek over in Plumas County, California. Where is Plumas County? Well, first, how many counties in California? That's a number that not too many people know. 58 counties in California. Plumas County sits northeast, abuts with Nevada, with the state of Nevada. It's about, I would say, if you go from south to north, 80%, Pima County is around that area. I'm not, not Pima, Plumas. Plumas County is around there. Um, so um, the story is going to be told by the video. Okay, let's get going here. base flow. And I'm going to read it for you. Prior to the middle 1950s, Red Clover Creek was a relatively shallow stream with permanent base flow supporting an excellent fishery. Shallow stream, permanent base flow, meaning there was base flow all the time. Good base flow, good quantities of base flow. That means that there was flow upstream, the upstream flow had gotten into the terrain, had moved out of the surface into the terrain it was flowing very slowly as base flow base flow was established in that creek and because of that since this creek goes through a meadow the meadow was very healthy uh, if you are raising cattle you want to raise cattle in the meadow in a meadow and um, because it's better the cattle are kind of if i may say so lazy they just want to eat all the time and, they want, and if it's flat it's better okay so they're raising cattle out there in the meadow so the meadow has got to have grass because otherwise the cattle can't eat and the grass will only eat if you if there's water enough out there particularly in california when you never know when it's going to rain okay and if it does rain it does rain out there but not as much as they would like to so they need the base flow Basically, that meadow needs the base flow in order to sustain the economic activity. And the economic activity out there is, is uh, ra raising cattle. Now, in the late 40s and early 50s, federal programs were introduced to eliminate willows using aerial herbicide, herbicide spray. Now, that, in retrospect, is bad because it caused a lot of havoc out there on the base flow. It hit the base flow and it basically eliminated the base flow. So therefore the meadow went down the drain or got really different than what it was before. And uh, people that live out there and are sustained by that type of a, a economy were, were kind of in trouble or suffering from this situation. Federal programs, do the federal agencies go out there and do something that is negatively affecting the ecosystem? And the answer is yes, based uh, out of ignorance. They didn't know. And we do a lot of things, engineers and everybody else, but does a lot of things out of ignorance. Uh, I was talking to somebody this morning and I said, uh, education should be like a, like a lily, I, like a color lily. I've talked to you about this before, that you should know a lot about a little and a little bit about a lot. And not about a little so you can sustain yourself and a little bit about a lot so that you can relate to the rest of the world. Because the rest of the world is not going to know what you know in your field. Nobody is, is, is strictly specialist in your field. So that's the way we should uh, uh, do education. I remember a lot about a little and a little bit about a lot. And these agencies like the, I don't like to be critical, but I'm going to state it out because it's true. Like the Soil Conservation Service at that time felt that they wanted to conserve water and therefore they're going to get rid of the vegetation. The theory was that the vegetation is breathing water, is a, a trans, uh, evapotranspiring. So if I wanted to get uh, augment the water amount or the amount of water, I could get rid of the vegetation and then that kind of evapotranspiration uh, would not be that evapotranspiration would not happen and then I would have more water, more runoff. Because that, of course, is, um, 
is a fallacy. Later, we have found out that that is a fallacy because water brings its own, I'm sorry, vegetation brings its own water. In other words, if you, um, if you take the vegetation out hoping that you will steal its water, the water will disappear and you will steal both. You will not have either the water or the vegetation. That is, that has been demonstrated. I've talked about this in surface water hydrology last year, and we can talk a little bit more about it later. So, and the reason is, the reason is, is kind of simple to explain. Nature is not cause effect. Nature is cybernetic. So if you hit something, it, it causes a, a ripple effect and it hits something else and else and else. It's not a just, I'm going to hit here to get there. That doesn't work that way because nature is self-sustaining. Uh, she created a cell for the whole purpose of self-sustenance. And XY relations like uh, cause effect, they don't work. They're good to an extent for physics. Physics is kind of, like, kind of like that to an extent. Now, we've been able to go to the moon because the, we had the right physics and a little bit of the chemistry. We did it well. We went and came back. But the world, the natural world, doesn't work that way. I would, my venture, I would venture to say that even the physics is kind of cybernetic, but that's going beyond what we're talking about here today. At about the same time, over 300 beaver were removed from the system. The beaver, what did the beavers do? Well, the idea was that the beavers were, were eating the trees and stuff like that, or eat, beavers eat, actually beavers don't eat the trees so much. What beavers do is they collect the, or they bite and take the trees out and they put them into the dams. Beavers are hydraulic engineers. If you go out there, you'll find, I don't have to tell you, 300 beaver dams were removed from the system. 300. If you go out there, you'll find beaver dams. I actually have a picture, a picture of a beaver dam that I took in Colorado more than 40 years ago. It was so huge, I have it on my site. A huge beaver dam. And I've seen another one, which is even larger. Unfortunately, I can't get my hands on the picture. It was in the Patagonia, meaning in southern Argentina. There was a 200 meter beaver dam out there, 200 meter long. I mean, that, that, I, I hadn't seen anything like that, okay? So beavers are very busy putting their dams together. Uh, why? The question is why? Because I think the answer is because they need to hide from the predators. And the beavers are, can, can, uh, can be comfortable underwater and, and outside of water, mostly, they're outside of water, but they also, they're very good swimmers. So if they uh, create a, a dam in a river, they'll be able to build their dens in the vicinity of the rivers with air and without having to fear the, the, the land predators. Okay, I'm not talking about the alligators. The alligators can do the same. The alligators can be land and, and, and sea, it doesn't matter. But yeah, beavers uh, are typically in places where there are no alligators. I hope I'm correct when I say that. Beavers here in the United States, in Colorado, in Arizona, I'm sure not here in California. They're generally mid-climate um, mid areas. If you wanna see, go see alligators, you gotta go see in areas where, there, where it's wet, like 1,500, 1,600 millimeter per year or more. 2,000, 3,000, there's a whole lot of alligators out there in the Amazon. The Amazon, uh, see, uh, Junkis have, have, have said, I read it recently, that it varies between 1,500 and 5,500 or 5,200 millimeters. That's extremely wet. That's extremely wet. In case you want to know how big is an, alli uh, an, uh, uh, an alligator or a uh, crocodile, don't, don't ever face those guys. That, Alligators are kind of small. They get to be about three meters, but the, a crocodile, a good crocodile of the Amazon, can measure up to nine meters. That has been documented by scientists that have looked at this. I hear nine meters, imagine the weight, and, and those people kind of move swift. So, I mean, those animals, you wouldn't stand a chance, but uh, certainly uh, we don't want that, but that, 
people have to be careful. Uh, that may be one of the reasons why out there in the Amazon, as I had said many times, there are not that many people out there. Even though Brazil is intent on developing the Amazon, they are going to fail. They have failed before, but then they have another politician that doesn't know what happened before, and then he continues with the same thing. We're going to develop the Amazon. We're going to extract the resources of the Amazon. Uh, the Amazon, you can extract the resources, but you got to be careful to identify where and how without doing any damage or very little damage to the ecosystem. And I don't think that that's what they're doing now. They just want to get out and exploit the resources and get them out. They're going to fail. Hopefully the gentleman that is in charge will not be in charge for too long. I know who, uh, who you, I'm talking about. I mean, you know who, who I'm talking about. So I'm not going to mention names. Okay. Uh, about the same time, okay. Long-standing effects of heavy grazing. Heavy grazing could also cause this problem. Heavy grazing is like ha uh, having land for 500 piece, uh, heads of cattle, and you put in there a thousand heads of cattle, hoping that it'll get better. No, it will get worse. And then eventually you have overgrazing. Um, overgrazing is done by people that don't know what they're doing, because if you're a good um, um, cattle uh, man or cattle person, you have to get somebody to tell you exactly what what is the capacity of the range that you're grazing. So as you can you can put as many heads as possible without eating into the capital. Basically, you you cannot eat into the capital because if you eat into the capital, basically it's like going to the bank and having a certain capital and then withdrawing every month something and by the end of a couple of years you don't have any capital, right? The capital is the capacity of, of these uh, uh, locations or situations to grow and produce, continue to produce uh, food stuff, I mean uh, uh, grass and stuff like that. So heavy grazing and a system of abandoned logging railroad grades are also logging Logging is important. Logging, you know, logging is something that we do all the time. But you, you can't lift uh, the trees that are, have been logged with your, with your finger. you got to transport them. So you got to have lo logging railroad grades. It says it here, railroad grades. Uh, brought uh, red clover to the, to the brink of collapse. Now, what actually happens in a system like this is a sequence or a succession of a couple of things. You have overgrazing, then you have drought, and then it causes trouble. First you have drought, and, it's, and the drought is followed by a flood. So the, 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 the drought exacerbates the overgrazing. And then after the drought, there's always a flood. That's just the way Mother Nature works. When she gives a little, then she gives a lot later. So then the flood would actually destroy the, the situation that has already been uh, weakened by the drought. So we can't avoid drought. We can defend ourselves against it, but we cannot avoid drought. Right now, I read in the paper today that California is going through its worst drought. California is a drought country. Why are we here in California? <laughs> People say because we like it. In California, we grew up here. But uh, at the beginning, it wasn't like that. We had to bring in the, the Bureau of Reclamation to help us. Without the Bureau of Reclamation, we wouldn't be here. I mean, that is a fact that has been written in the books. Okay, I don't have to say it. Uh, so in 1903, uh, the federal government decided that uh, California was not gonna prosper unless the federal government put some bucks in there to support it. So they created the Bureau of Reclamation, which is responsible for the handling of the reclamation, meaning the recovery for irrigation, for, for the economy of the lands that are subject to drought. And we, right now, we're in a major drought. Uh, hopefully, everybody knows, that I happen to know that if we have a major drought now, then you're gonna have a major flood following in the next few years, three, four, or five years. So we better be prepared. I'm hoping that the people of the Department of Water Resources know this, and they're prepared for the sequence of droughts first and then floods. So you can sweat it the other way. When there's a big flood, there's gonna be a drought following. We had a big, big flood in 2017. It almost broke the, one of the major dams. The second largest dam in California was almost 
broken. It was actually destroyed, half destroyed, not the dam, the, the spillways. The two spillways were destroyed. It was lucky that it stopped raining right at that time where it was, not so, where it was gonna be causing a tremendous amount of damage and even killing people. But it stopped because it, it was lucky. We were lucky at the time. We may not be, may not be as lucky the next time. So we gotta be prepared. So once the gully formed, once you have a gully, once you have uh, the removal of vegetation, the removal, uh, particularly the removal of uh, riparian vegetation, that was bad. Since then, riparian vegetation has taken uh, uh, an element of respect. Prior to this experience, everybody thought riparian, riparian vegetation was there so that we could take it out and uh, remove it. Not anymore. Now, riparian vegetation is considered to be um, a good a good thing. And I'll have a chance to talk about this in more detail later on. Okay, so once the gully, it, the gully formed right after they removed the vegetation. In other words, where you had a depth of three feet or four feet, all of a sudden you had a depth of 15, 20 feet. So then there's more gravity, the water drained out, and, and the creek was left without base flow. Not only was it left without base flow, but the groundwater, which was on the surface, close to the surface, say within a foot or two from the ground, dropped to about 10 feet or 15 feet. So therefore the grasses could not, could not uh, feed themselves that water. They couldn't pull up the water because it was too far next to the river. And if you can see, look at the geomorphology out there, if you have a hole which is 20, 20 feet deep, it will draw the water from everywhere. If it's flat, worse off. And then the entire meadow could go down the drain because it's so flat, okay? There's no gravity in there to help. Okay. So of all the reasons for the formation of the Feather River Coordinated Resource Management Group in 1985, none was more important than the loss of red clover. So they lost red clover. So the local people uh, put together a group of experts, university and federal government, and local people that are, that are interested and knowledgeable on, on the subject of ecosystem management. This is kind of like arid ecosystem. It's not quite, I think the rain out there is about five, 600. So it's not a whole lot of water out there, but there is enough water, okay? So they put, they put this uh, group, resource management group in 1985. Then in the year 2005, I believe, no, 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 2010. It was in the year 2010 that they got together out there on the river and celebrated their 25 year anniversary. And they invited me to, to join them. So I did and I, I took this video. It was at the time that we had just started learning how to do videos. So this video is kind of uh, one of the first videos. Within a year that we were doing videos, we produced this video. Look at the, uh, at even the resolution is pretty bad. Now we are videos nowadays have, a, nowadays have an excellent resolution. <laughs> I was one of the but I don't know ten members, members that helped put together the Red Clover Valley uh, Demonstration Project in 19. Donna was the person that was first involved with the with the recovery of uh, of this creek. Uh, she is by profession a range manager. A range manager is a kind of an interesting. It's an agricultural uh, profession. It's, it's, they manage the range. It's like not quite the irrigation, but the range. Uh, they're supposed to be technically an, an engineer and ecologist at the same time. She identified in the middle 80s and late 80s that it was necessary to look at the base flow and protect it, protect the base flow, because she knew that the base flow had been lost out there at the Red Clover. Yes, I mean, yeah, she was out there and she, she saw what was happening, studied it. She had the background to study it. 
So she developed the idea of studying the bass drum, hiring somebody to study the bass drum. And at the time, uh, that was in 1989, I believe, right? At the time, I was uh, looking for work. I'm not, I'm, I've never been employed, unemployed, but I was looking for work because a professor can do work, consulting or research, research mostly. So I applied for this program that she was developing at uh, PG&E. She used to work with PG&E. PG&E, by the way, had a very large and very active research branch at the time. Now, they don't have it anymore because they have run into trouble. Unlucky over the last couple of decades, okay? But she was there at the right time, at the right place, and I was able to benefit from the sources that were coming out, the monies that were coming out from PG&E for research. So I was lucky that uh, when she put out her RFP, nobody applied but Professor Ponce. So she called me up at the beginning of the summer and said, you know, Professor Ponce, uh, you're the only candidate, so you have it. So I took it. I took the job. I knew that I knew nothing about bass drum. I was a flood guy from the beginning, from the early 70s, I was a flood guy. And flood is not bass drum, it's like two sides of the coin. You either look at one side, which is flood, and the other one is bass drum, or drought, you could say. But bass, bass drum is not the same as drought, okay? We can distinguish that. But I knew that I, I had to learn it. And I did not want people to refer to me later as with the label, this is a flood guy. All he knows is floods. So then I said, this is my great opportunity to be paid for a year to do work in, in an area that I don't know. That's the exact truth, by the way. So I spent two years actually studying bass drum. We produced a report that we have looked at, a very good report, short of excellent. I mean, because it was the first time anybody was doing this. When I hired a student to do some library research, because we used to do library research at the time, there was no web, okay? Uh, we identified about 50 base flow papers and barely in about 1,500 to 2,000 floods. And now if you Google the ratio between one versus the other, it would be like 100 or 200, uh, the ratio of Google sites, citations. I am pretty sure, I'm not gonna do it now, but I'm pretty sure if you Google floods, you get 20, 30 million easily, okay? But not on base flow. Okay, so that's uh, Donna's story. And she was there in the year 2010 for the 25 year anniversary. So imagine uh, she was very young when she got involved in this. 85. This, uh, you can see in the background here, is a uh, the largest check dam we put on this channel. There's four check dams all together. This was the most upstream check dam. It was about nine feet um, Maybe in height when it was first put in. Now it's, you can see it's overgrown. She was instrumental, or she was behind the idea or design or decision to build check dams so that they could raise the level of the stream. And right here, you see a check dam. One of four she put in there. There's a lot of sediment deposition. That's a view of the dam. It's a bunch of rocks out there dumped into the river to raise the level, and it that it does raise the level. These dams are not going anywhere because the rocks are too heavy. The flow is not that strong. The first dam downstream. This is Dan Kafer or Kaffer from Soil Conservation Service. And I, I'm chuckling in here because these guys were the guys that removed the, the, the riparian. So they're kind of the guys responsible for the whole thing happening in the first place. It may not be Dan, because this is 1985, or I'm sorry, 2010. And the stuff that was done by SES was in the 60s. So it would have been one or two generations removed from Dan. But the point that I'm mentioning here is that US Natural Resources Conservation Service that uh, succeeded the Soil Conservation Service. The, the Soil Conservation Service in 1995 became the Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's another story. It was like three feet tall and it was in the bedrock. Bill, you know, was there during its construction. And the next dam raises the water six feet. And then this one, another 
or this one nine feet. So if you have pond to pond to pond downstream, and you start with bedrock control going upstream to create this dam that then backs water up for half a mile and recharges the whole watershed. And if you look at, out in the meadow, you can see the piezometer wells that Donald Lindquist here uh, in the mid 80s was monitoring. Well, this is a fascinating project because really it was an experiment, experimental thing. Because check dams have a, a mixed bag. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not successful. It depends on the geomorphology, the local situation. It's pretty hard and the, the profession doesn't have enough experience with check dams. I mean, I've seen references where they don't like them. They say, no, 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 don't put in the check dams. Or others that say, oh no, check dams are gonna solve the problem. Um, we had a couple, a couple, not a couple, two instances in Colorado where the Forest Service went in there and put a lot of check dams and they fixed it. So at least those two projects were successful. And we will probably talk What's about happening that. with the groundwater and how it was recharging the groundwater out away from the stream uh, bed and, and recreating the meadow situation down there and improving water quality and creating wildlife habitat and all the great stuff that happened. What had happened here? It's a fascinating, really. The check dams were okay, but they were taking too long. The people were getting antsy, and that is true. I mean, we have a, a, an example of Camp Creek in uh, Oregon, Oregon, where they decided to do a different thing. They, did, they wouldn't put any check dams, but they did some uh, fencing to eliminate uh, cattle from getting into the river or getting into the stream because the cattle were were um, stomping on the on the stream and they were destroying. Uh, it's called um, I don't remember the word. They were stomping on the stream and destroying the stream. So the uh, uh, Bureau of Land Management went over there and fenced the whole thing, and the fencing worked. It helped. I was there to document it for a couple times, 15 year interval, and the stream is recovering. But the calculation, if you extrapolate the process, the process of sedimentation inside the stream that is going on, it would take about 50 years from now to, to, to recover completely. So the question whether people have 50 years or not, that is up in the air, you know? I mean, it depends on the local people moving, moving the, the forces that be or the powers that be in order to put the resources together to fix the stuff. Either you fix it in five years or you fix it in 50 years. The case of Camp Creek was 50 years. In this case, people were kind of antsy and they were looking at the check dams or saying, okay, when is this going to happen? And it wasn't happening. So in 1995, that was 10 years after Donna Lindquist was there, the coordinator resource management, that means the group of those people, developed a technology called Pond and Plug. And this is kind of an unusual situation because the pond and plug is, is that's something that a lot of people say that you shouldn't do. You shouldn't mess too much with the river. Well, these guys went out there and basically mess with the river. Pond and plug seeks to eliminate the gully through on-site excavation and fill. In other words, if the river wants to go here, uh, they are going to say, no, we're going to stop you. We're going to go here and there. We're going to make you do what we want you to do, forcing the water level in the valley to rise to meet the historic remnant. In other words, they put a lot of dams out there uh, locally. Exactly how they did it, I honestly don't know. I wasn't there when they did it. I was only there after the fact when they were kind of celebrating that this stuff had worked. And I was not there in 1995. I was there in the year 2010 which means they had 15 years of experience with this pawn and plug technique. But what I know is that they were so successful in raising the level faster than the check dams that, that they were being called all over the world to go and tell them how they did it. Because I mean, the numbers show, right? As you can see, there's some time elapsed here. In 2006, the pawn and plug technique was used in additional forms of red clover downstream of the original check dam project. Now over here, if you look at here, I'm going to show you here. 
That's Red Clover in the year 2010. I was there in the year 1989, 1990, so 20 years earlier. And there was a hole out there. There was a hole. It was not, a, it was not like that. It was like this very lo low amount of water, small amount of water running low, running like 14, 15 feet lower. And he's going to document that later on. So as you can see, they this pond and plug technique recovered the the base flow. Because what's coming out of there is base flow. It's coming out of the ground, mostly out of the ground. Okay, so it's recovered. Scott, uh... This is Jim Wilcox, who the head of the resource management group at the time. I don't know if he's still there. Uh, I knew Jim from various encounters that we had when I visited over there. So he's the gentleman that invited me to go to this party. It was a party. Oh. And father-in-law, George, asked us to come out and take a... George is the owner of the range. And George was calling Will uh, Jim to say, hey, let's do this. To look at things because something was happening and that was that the check dams were actually kicking flood water out onto the valley, which was a good thing, but but a lot of flood water was heading over where those cattle are and there's actually an old remnant channel probably maybe from dixie creek a tributary that ran down that side of the valley and so it was focusing the the flow in that channel and then he's talking about an old remnant channel we got to understand that this is a flat area in this river, a river, several, one river, main river and various tributaries. And all these rivers have meandered in the past. So they had created many old remnant channels. You may not see it from the surface, but if you, if you fly over it and be very careful into what you're seeing, you will find the remnant channels, the Oxbow Lakes and so forth. Um, McReynolds Creek took off to the north and that's on your map. That's all was also treated in this project. And it was a gully. So when that water, that, that flood water was captured by the, the remnant channel and, and hit the uh, uh, McReynolds Creek gully, it began head cutting back up that side of the valley. So in essence, it was 800 feet away. This project was at risk of head cutting is when you have the beginning of a river and it's steep out there. So when it starts raining upstream, it head cuts. It's it's like the New River that head cut it 40 kilometers on its way into the Southern Sea. Being end run. The uh, the old gully was was right here, and then it cut across to the other side of the valley. So the way that it cuts back to the right on dry soil, that's a plug. That was the first plug on the main stem of, of red clover. The ponds and plugs you see in the background are the treatment of the, Mc, of the McReynolds Creek Gully. And that extends all the way to the base of that uh, cone-shaped knoll there. Uh, Unfortunately, we did not have the time at the time because it was a party to go out there and visit every one of these sites. I would have liked to do that, but that was not the case. We had to see them from afar, which means you not really fully understand the physical situation. You have to be told. And 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 then the the uh, red clover gully continued on around the far side of the valley. So we have a, a flood there, another barrel site which is a pond, and then another, another flood, and so on. This channel here in the foreground was here, the remnant channel, and by basically. Um, uh, eliminating the gully as a conduit for flow out of the valley, that, that caused the shallow groundwater and surface water to begin to rise. The next low spot to, con con to convey flow was the old channel. So we didn't have to do anything to the channel. We didn't have to build any channels. All we had to do was allow the water to find it. How much higher is the flow running over here now that uh, the system is working? By the way, I don't know if you notice it, but that's me talking, asking a question. I asked him, 
what's the difference in elevation between the before and after project? Victor brought up a good point, um, and I actually don't have, I, I, I probably should for this kind of a presentation to have a picture of the gully right over there. If we were out here pre-project, running here would actually be running 14 feet. If you were out here pre-project, and we were out there pre-project, 1989, he said it was 14, it was lifted 14 through the intervention of the plug and pond and plug technique. So river restoration at its best. Never mind, the river doesn't look the way it used to, but it's gotten better in terms of the, uh, the base flow and the meadow has improved. That's how much the water table has risen. Uh, we have 14 foot deep gully out there about 100 feet wide. The water levels have been raised about 14 feet. The basal has increased substantially and the meadow is well on its way to recovery. This was done in the year 2010. I honestly have not followed suit. I haven't really gotten in touch with Jim. Maybe I should. Maybe I should go out there and do a an update on this project, but I haven't done it. This is quite a site here in the vicinity of Red Clover Creek. What you see in here is the water table. The depth of the water table is about a foot or a foot and a half in here. This would not have been the case 20 to 25 years ago when this project was started. If you notice over here, right next to the to the to the pool, we've got this grass in here. And the grass is there, and as we move up uphill, so to speak, here, uphill we reach a gradient, and pretty soon you start seeing sagebrush. Well, the sage well the sagebrush doesn't like water. In other words, if the if the groundwater is within a foot or a foot and a half, the sagebrush doesn't grow there. So since the sagebrush doesn't want to grow there, then the grass can take over. It's a fight. It's a matter of a fight. And the environmental conditions determine what vegetation is going to win. When it's wet area, uh, not too wet, but it's wet enough. You see, it matters. Then the grass and the animals eat grass. Typically, the animals would not eat the sagebrush. Although I'm pretty sure if they're really, really, really hungry, they probably eat it, but they don't want to. They don't like the sagebrush. Brush. I'm not 100% sure of that, though. I know for a fact that goats will eat anything. They, that's why goats are the last in the scene of the crime. First, the cattle, when it's overgrazed by cattle, then the, the, the cattle raisers move out and then the sheep raisers move in. And then following one more generation, then the sheep, the sheep overgraces the range, and then the sheep uh, growers have to move out, and then the, then the goats, the goat raisers, I mean the people that grow goats have to come in, or they are the last ones. There's nothing after goats. If goats have to go, then there's nothing. It's just pure rock out there, because the rocks will eat, I mean the goats will eat just about anything including rock. I, I hate to put it that way, but that is almost the truth. I've seen it in cases. I've traveled many places and I've seen it in the field. Does not like a lot of water. So do you, uh, you are positive then that this kind of technology for, for stream and creek restoration would benefit your project? Absolutely. This is the most progressive work of this kind that I've ever seen. It's basically step by step undoing the steps that led to the erosion. The Maidu group is, a, I believe it's a, it's an Indian reservation out there. You know, we have 40 or 50 reservations in California. And dewatering of the water table of this entire, entire metal system water-based system. 
So this is an opportunity for people that are interested in hydrology and engineering and environmental restoration to really see 25 years worth of work and the results of it. Okay, there is, what am I going to do in here? Um, okay, so there is no report on this. However, there is a story because uh, Professor Pons has written stories. I uh, started writing my first story in the year 2002 and I did it for 10 years. Every month I would write a story. So I wrote 120 stories. Then I ran out of steam. And so in the last 10 years or nine years, I have done 10 stories. So one tenth of the production, because you do have a tendency to run out of ideas. But this is one of them. These are supposed to be short stories. And it could be, I classified them into three, I, everything, I put everything in a box. Uh, label zero is everybody can read it. Label, level one or yeah, level, that's not label, level. Level zero, everybody, anybody, just for everybody. Everybody, the population. Uh, level one is for a few people, like if you have to be kind of an engineer, a technically minded person. And level two is you have to be uh, knowledgeable in the particular field. Because you know there's levels in knowledge. In every type of knowledge, there's always levels. So um, this is the story that we put together, which is kind of repetitious. So I am not going to go over it. We've already gone over this. But over here, we have pictures before and after. Confluence of Red Clover and McReynolds Creek. OK, the one on the left is my picture. And the one on the right is, uh, is uh, the picture that they gave me when I was there. So as you can see, the, the level over here, you can see the depth in here, at least 10 feet, if not more. While in here, the water is close to the surface. You can see it. You can almost feel that it's close to the surface. This one's even better. Now, you can see that this is the same area. Why is it the same area? Because this hill over here has a weird shape, right? And over here is the same. The only difference is that it's not quite the same spot. But it's obvious that the water level over here is very high. It's within a foot. While over here is, you can see in here, there's several feet in here, maybe eight feet, maybe not eight, but six, definitely six feet in here. Unfortunately, I don't have a measure. I wasn't there to measure it, but it, it's a visual inspection of what's going on out there. We know for a fact that the water level in uh, Red Clover is a lot higher now than it was when Donna Linquist started her project in 1985. That is 35 years ago. And over the last 10 years, it was a lot faster. It went up a lot faster because of the pond and plug technique uh, that Jim Wilcox and his associates uh, worked on for the last 10 years out there. I'm told by Jim that he has been all over the world trying to repeat this thing and do it, I mean, teach other people to do it, which is great. Okay, so that's the end of the story of uh, Red Clover. So we got about 10 minutes in here, so I'm going to get started. Uh, the next, uh, this week, we got to talk about, oh, our subject is the Salton Sea. I got three papers in the Salton Sea. And this is going to take a good period of time, so we're fine. We're, we're on the money here. We're okay. So let me just get started with this issue of time engineering. Time engineering. When I was in Colombia, back in the year 2008. I have a friend of mine who was a very good friend. We were office mates over at Colorado State. We both were getting doctoral degrees at the same time. And uh, he went back to Colombia and he set up eventually, you know, it takes time, but eventually he set up a consulting firm and he's very successful in his consulting endeavors. Professor Pons took the, took the uh, uh, professorship here over here at San Diego State and I am very successful in the teaching but I guess I guess it's a different type of success okay so I was there to visit his projects he has a uh, the, the what he is doing out there among other things that he does he has a, a, a company I wouldn't call it a large company 
he must have at least 10 or 15 employees, which is kind of, in the US, would be small, okay? Here, small company, 10 employees, large, middle size, mid size, 100, 200, and large, the 5,000 outfits, like you have several here in the United States, right? Uh, I don't wanna mention names. But the point is that um, he was there and he, uh, it was interesting, fascinating. And I'm gonna share this with you guys because it's important. I was studying sediment out there at Colorado State and he was studying groundwater. Not that we didn't know anything else. We were just concentrating and his thesis was on groundwater and my thesis was on sediment. Well, turn the page uh, 30 years later and it turned out that I was doing groundwater and he was doing sediment opposite of what we trained at Colorado State. Why is that? Because life takes you here and there. You can't all the time choose and say, oh, I'm a sediment, I'm only gonna do sediment because then you're missing opportunities in other areas. Fortunately, and hopefully you've been trained to switch jobs or switch areas within the general field a little bit here and there. I switched into groundwater in the year 2005, late in the game, if you wanna call it a game, because I was given, given the opportunity to do this. And I said, I already know this half of the stuff. I just need to learn the other half, like I told you before. And I did, and I became a groundwater sustainability expert over the last 15, 16 years. And we're gonna talk about that later on. Now, my friend, whose name is Carlos, Carlos uh, originated or started working with groundwater, but eventually he got into rivers, river mechanics, engineering, river engineering, and he developed the application of the off-guard vein to control rivers. What is the off-guard vein? I should show some pictures. We have some pictures. Um, the off-guard vein is a, um, is a, uh, what's the description? Is a metal plate that you, you place in the river with a mecha by mechanical means in order to put a stop to the meandering. It's like sowing. You're gonna sow the river to its place and not let it move. So Professor Odgard from Iowa State, no, University of Iowa, I'm sorry, had developed the, the theory of the vein, of the hydraulic vein which has been referred to in the, in, in the last 20, 30 years since he developed this, is the odd guard vein. Odd guard, I believe, is a Dutch name. So it's O-D-G-A-A-R-D. -A -A Those names with A-A's, double A's, are, have a tendency to be originating in that part of the world. So Professor Odgard developed this. But I am not sure that he actually applied it because he's a like, professor. He's the one thinking about this. So my friend Carlos was the one that actually extensively applied this. He, last count, he had about 20 projects. And each project, he, he nails maybe 80, maybe 100 of these, of these uh, metal frames coping to control the river. So, basically the word is so, to sew the river into its place and not let it move. Why, wouldn't wanna, why would you want to do that? Well, you get hired he gets hired by the transportation engineers that have done or designed or constructed or built a, a uh, highway right next to the river. They do that because, I mean, that's what they want to do, go, go from point A to point B. And very little they, they realize that, that they are right next to the river. Well, they know that they were right next to the river, but they didn't think that it was going to move. But five, ten years later, after the road was built, the river started to move, and it endangered the road. So then that's when they called a surgeon, my friend. You can do it. You can fix it. We're going to pay you. Tell us, give us a proposal. So he does that, and he started doing this around 20 years ago. I would say 25 years ago, because he was talking to me about it in the early 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Uh, by the year 2000, he was putting his first, first project together. He's done 20 projects. In the process of doing that, he has gotten rich. Because one thing is consulting, where you peddle your ideas. And another thing is building. When you build, you're, you're peddling iron, I mean, stuff, material. That's 10 times, 100 times more expensive than just thinking about it. Consulting is not 
to make money, to be honest with you. Okay, so he has become rich in the process of doing these projects. He does it for the highway departments around Colombia, all over the place. He has done like 20 projects. Uh, why hasn't he done more? Maybe they were not needed because th this is surgery. Surgery, you do surgery only when you don't have anything else that you could do, okay? They want to put these uh, nails. It's a kind of a, a shield to, to stop the erosion, stop the movement of the river so that he would not uh, encroach upon the highway, which is already built. Okay, so he wanted me to visit, what, on, so in the year 2008, I was there, visited the project, and contemplating from a little, from a distance, the project, I said to him, Carlos, I believe you are a time engineer. And he said, oh, really, what is that? And I said, well, I just invented it, a time engineer, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in this class, in the following class. And then, subsequently, uh, I use a term, and people are going like, what, what is that? I mean, never heard of it. So I said, I'm going to write it down. So I sat down in the year 2015 to write down the concept of time engineering. And we eventually did a video. So I'm going to ask the, those of you that uh, have time, we can watch the video, because I'm going to go over the paper. I'm not going to uh, show you the video. Because it's the same thing. The video has the paper. The paper has a video. Okay, but the next time we come, I am going to uh, extensively spend a lot of time on this time engineering because it is not only instructive, it is fascinating, it is correct, in my opinion. Okay, there's a few claims out there that are, may be a little bit of far fetched, but no, it's not far fetched because Professor Pons has a lot of experience in this area. I've been working with these subjects for 40 years. It's a combination of geology geomorphology, hydrology, and ecology. Those are the four sciences. We did the same thing in the Pantanal 20, 25 years ago. No, more than 25, 40 years ago, 79, 80. So that's 42 years ago. So we've been doing this for a long time, and we, I think we do understand the processes, interdisciplinary processes. You could hire a geomorphologist, and he'll tell you the solution in terms of geomorphological terms, but it's not the same. You have to do also the hydrology. And they don't know that, unfortunately. Believe me, I happen to know what I'm talking. Okay, so time engineering, that's where they got started back in the year 2008. And the uh, long story made short is that we engineers have to design for a certain period of time. You design a dam and, and people are going to ask you, how long is it going to last? So you say, well, you know, it could get flooded. And if it gets flooded, if it's an, if it's an earthen dam, it'll be destroyed. I can calculate the spillway so that it won't get destroyed. So that's where we originated the concept of you can design the spillway of a dam for say a thousand year return period or 5,000 or even 10,000. 10,000 is the, is the summum, the, the, the maximum. We hardly ever, if any, if any time, go to more than 10,000 because 10,000 is 400, 400 generations of human population, 400 generations. It's like almost the beginning of civilization. Uh, civilization is purported to have been started in China 11,000 years ago. Then came the Egyptians and so forth. The rest of the people were running around in caves at that time. In Europe, certainly, uh, in caves in the year, say, eight to 10,000 years ago. Then came the civilization that started in earnest in uh, Iraq, in what it's, in the Mesopotamia. The Mesopotamia is the middle of two rivers. Potamia is the river in, in, in Greek. So there's the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. They kind of join, they don't join. They kind of go by. And that, that has to uh, attribute to the geomorphology of the local region that had these two rivers kind of get close together, but they don't join. So civilization started right there in the middle between those two rivers because they had access to the water and so on and so forth. Um, interesting to notice that that's dry area. It's kind of a dry area, but it had water because the water was coming with the rivers. So dry area with the water is like the Salton Sea, which we're going to talk about today. Okay. Uh, I don't know who's doing that. Civilization then 
uh, comes with the water. So this is where I'm going to be stopping in here. You can watch the video. I'm going to ex extensively explain what the concept of time engineering is. I'm thinking about maybe I should show the video. First of all, let's take a look at the, at the content and we'll do that first and then we will show the video. So with that, I will, I will finish this class and continue this Thursday. Thank you very much. Thank you.